Hello, everyone. Happy Monday and welcome to the latest installment of our Money Matters uh, series in partnership with USF College of uh, Education, Gus A. Stavros Center. We are super excited today to be joined by a, an amazing panel of experts to talk about a topic that is very relevant right now, and that is disaster preparedness. Um, if you are new to our Money Matters series, um, every other month, we are joined by experts to talk about financial topics that are important to you and can give you the information and confidence to become financially stable or improve, improve your financial stability. Um, this is a, a series that has covered things like credit scores, how to um, start your own business, how to buy a home, budgeting, and so much more. Um, so we have a really great panel ahead today. Um, we are joined by Mary Burrell, a program leader at Pinellas County Emergency Management, Mike Boylan, founder of Mike's Weather Page, uh, and Sarah Vitale, planning director at Tampa Bay Regional Planning Council. Um, thank you three so much for joining us today. Um, we have a really great Money Matters ahead um, on disaster preparedness and what to do um, during this upcoming hurricane season and throughout the year. Um, and now I'm gonna give you each an opportunity to introduce yourself. Awesome, thank you so much. Uh, I'll go first. So Sarah Vitale, Planning Director of the Tampa Bay Regional Planning Council. Uh, if you've never heard of us, uh, TBRPC, we're a regional planning council, one of 10 in the state. We work with six counties and 23 cities in the Tampa Bay region. So Citrus County, Hernando, Pasco, Pinellas, Hillsborough and Manatee counties, and also often working with Sarasota County. And our role is to provide technical assistance and resources to local governments. We're somewhat an extension of the city and county staff. And uh, I'm here today to discuss a lot of our work in ec economic development and uh, resiliency planning, but also emergency preparedness. Uh, over the last 30 years, the Regional Planning Council has been assisting counties to create an all hazards disaster planning guide. And I uh, really thank the United Way Suncoast for the invitation and, and uh, for all of you for being here today. Mike, do you wanna go next? Yeah, hello everybody. Uh, my name is Mike, Mike's brother page. Um, I'm a uh, lo local Pinellas County resident. I'm a Florida native, started, started a website back in 2004 and um, uh, just a hobbyist kind of started out as a hobby has turned a little bit more and, and you know I'm pleased to say I got se several million now following across all social and uh, so what I do I, I provide a website that pretty much links uh, graphics from National Hurricane Center and, and uh, National Weather Service and various spaghetti models and kind of the go-to site for, for many you know when tropical season comes if you need all the information on one page and I'll also run a lot of social media now with all the platforms and do a daily show in the mornings and you know we just sit back and drink coffee and talk models and predictions and uh luckily now with uh, even the state of florida and kevin guthrie the fdm you know reach reaches out now when there's a storm so i um you know pleased to be able to do stuff like this and work with the counties and, and even states now and helping you know spread information and uh you know with the new world we live in with technology and i'm you know i just provide a unique way to do that <laughs> Hi, and I'm uh, Mary Burrell. I am the whole community engagement program lead for Pinellas County Emergency Management. And uh, what whole community means is uh, finding basically the resources and the partners in our community and um, connecting uh, with sometimes the more uh, traditionally isolated populations uh, in our community and kind of matching them and connecting to them and, um, you know, and helping, helping them prepare. So I'm excited to, uh, to share with you. Awesome. Thank you, Mary. And um, I'm also excited to say that we have just been joined by my co-host, Dr. Peter Tragus. Um, Peter, would you like to introduce yourself? Yes. Uh, hi, Matthew. Thank you. Sorry, I had a little technical difficulties there. Uh, I'm Peter Trakis. I'm the director of the uh, USF Gus A. Stavros Center for Financial Literacy and Economic Education. And we teach financial literacy and, and sustainability and all kinds of concepts. And we're excited to partner with Matthew and the United Way on this. Uh, we've been doing it for a while and looking forward to continue. Thanks. Thank you, Peter. And um, thank you to our amazing panel again for joining us today. We have a really fantastic conversation in store um, and a, 
bunch of different topics related to disaster preparedness, whether that's, you know, how to make sure that you're prepared if something is coming our way, what to do if you're hit, and then what to do after in recovery. Um, and in addition to the questions that we have prepared for the panel today, um, you have the Q&A feature available here in Zoom. So if there's something eating away at your mind that you want to share with the panel or you want to ask them, um, please use that Q&A feature so we can uh, share your question with the panel and they'll have an opportunity to answer it today. Um, I also ask that before, after you head out today, um, if you don't mind taking a very brief anonymous satisfaction survey, um, that way we can learn how to make sure that we're offering the best Money Matters experience possible. It'll take you just a minute of your time. Um, and we can just get uh, started with the questions now. Um, and so the first one um, is really, let's just set the stage for, you know, what are disasters looking like in Florida? Um, you know, for the Suncoast region in particular, you know, what natural disasters um, are usually top of mind for folks or are most common? Um, and how are the preparations for them a little different? Uh, I could start with that, I guess. Uh, you know, we, we living in Florida, you know, we just had an El Nino winter season and it, tornadoes are one uh, disaster that I don't think a lot of folks realize. You know, Florida is one of the leading states that has tornadoes. And uh, we saw a couple of days ago up in Tallahassee, they're under a tornado watch again today of all things, you know, we've had them here in Pinellas County uh, leading up to the winter months. So uh, recently too, with flooding, uh, we were seeing, you know, Idalia and uh, we had tropical storm Ada just back in 2020. Uh, so coastal areas are starting to see more and more impacts with just uh, everyday high tides uh, starting to impact coastal areas. So that seems to be like a new, uh, you know, issue for a lot of folks living, especially along the Pinellas County beaches. Um, just back in December, we had a no-name storm that came up and a couple, you know, hundreds of homes were flooded in uh, Indian Rocks Beach area. So that's another issue. And then we got hail season. Hail season's coming up this time of year. You people don't realize it, but uh, we get a lot of hail in Florida. So all this leads up to hurricane season, which we know now is, uh, you know, the predictions are very high, very active season. Uh, you know, pretty much every expert that I've I've seen this year is predicting 21 plus. That means we're going to go past the W's into a whole new list of names. Um, so we're definitely on pace for a very busy season. And that means we need to prepare. You know, Mike is, uh, he hit on a lot of really good points as far as uh, the kind of new, <laughs> new and frequent um, severe weather, you know, that we're having now. And uh, one thing I think people too uh, make a little bit of a miscalculation is uh, when we have uh, tropical storms. Um, you know, people say it's just a tropical storm. It's just a category one. Um, you know, Hurricane Irma a few years ago, most people who were here remember that we didn't have power for, for weeks, some people. And, um, you know, that was only a tropical storm force winds when it came through Pinellas County. And so, uh, you know, so it, it's hard to uh, it's hard to get people to take all of these different um, hazards seriously. Totally agree. I, I use that a lot. Um, it's only it's only it's only it's only. And, uh, you know, I always bring up Sandy was only a subtropical category one. And uh, Florence was an example I use a lot. It didn't hit us, but it was a 14 billion dollar disaster for the Carolinas. And it was just a category one. So we have to. Mm -hmm not focus on the category strength as much as the effects and every storm is different. You know, every storm brings different hazards and risks. I'll just add uh, the second part of your question, you know, how do we best prepare, uh, especially with the tornadoes? I, I think everyone needs to be uh, knowledgeable of the different alert systems along our communication networks for the, the cities and counties and even the state. That you can subscribe so that you get texts and calls warning you if there's any sort of disaster uh, at, at hand. So in the case of a tornado, you might not have a lot of time to prepare or to, to um, you know, get to a safe shelter place. And if you don't know it's coming, you know, that that's a real number one issue. So uh, subscribing to those alert uh, resources from your city, county and from the state alert Florida uh, would be a good first step. Yeah, and on the tornadoes, too, it's all about planning, right? Mm -hmm. And so uh, knowing where your safe place is, you know, in your home, at your office, your community center, your church, wherever you spend your time, um, you know, knowing beforehand and, and practicing that. So when something does happen, you have, what, like 12 seconds to get <laughs> somewhere safe? 
you know, so if you know where to go, you know, that closet, you know, the bathroom, you know, your, you know, the stairwell at your, your work or whatever, um, you know, you need to need to plan ahead and, and know what you're going to do too. Yeah, yeah. I do want to touch on all that. One thing I hear a lot of is with modern cell phone technology and going into sleep modes and, and mm -hmm. having notifications turned off. It happens with me frequently too. I don't even bother because I, these phones are so hard sometimes to figure out. So no, you know, make sure your notifications are on when you go to bed and have, have a cheap weather radio. Uh, you know, they sell them for 20 bucks, uh, have some way to get alerts because you can't always rely on your phones and your phone goes dead in the middle of the night. You know, the, so that's very important. I tell people to make, you know, have a cheap weather radio that runs on batteries and, and always make sure your phone notifications are on for weather. Great. Well, um, let me ask you this. So we've talked a lot about different disasters and, and stuff like that, but specifically how are hurricanes different from those other disasters and what are the biggest concerns that we have with them? Is it the flood? Is, is it the wind? Is it the water? What 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 should we be looking out for? You want to take that, Mike? Yeah, I'll be, I don't want to hog everything. But uh, so, again, I think every storm is different. You know, Charlie was a four and Ian was a four completely different impacts and a lot of comparisons were made because of Charlie, like, oh, you know, I, Charlie was nothing. I, you know, that was okay. And, you know, or Ian and Ian came along and, uh, you know, doubled the surge, tripled the rain. It was, you know, four times the size. So every storm is different in the impacts. Uh, we could, we can have a, a weak tropical storm dump 20, 30, 40 inches of rain and create a flooding nightmare. And, and that hap that's happened in the past. Um, you know, when Ian crossed our state, we had a lot of flooding in, in rivers in areas that have never flooded in 500 years. And it was only a tropical storm when it exited the state of Florida. We had all that seawall damage over Daytona. So again, it was just a tropical storm when it exited. So uh, initially, you know, along the coast, the winds are the biggest impacts. But, you know, what we saw with Idalia last year, trees go down in areas that aren't used to having these type of storms. And when you start having trees go down, you have power outages uh, and, and this can go well inland. So I think the inland effects don't ever get talked about enough um, with who can you know feel feel the disasters and the impacts. Um, so again, every storm's a little different. Uh, some are fast moving, won't produce any surge. Some are slow moving. So we got to look at every storm and, and I think educate. These are the impacts that you might experience, um, and just let the public know: power outages, flooding. Uh, you know, because because like, every you know tornadoes can can expand way outside the center, and that was something. A lot of folks during Irma first figured out was they focused on the landfall in Naples, but we had such a large system. There was tornadoes all the way up through, you know, Brunswick and Jacksonville and Daytona because of the large size. So concentrating on those impacts, just letting letting everybody know there's always a, a, a large amount of people that are affected from a hurricane versus a, a more isolated event like a tornado. You know, that's been a conversation like statewide with the emergency managers, you know, focusing on the impact, getting people away from the cone. You know, the cone's like a really good way to say, hey, we're coming, you know, knock, knock, knock. But um, but you know, getting away from watching that because you know the the impacts, you know, are everything. Um, storm surge, people don't take that very seriously, especially, you know, around the bar barrier islands, all the evacuation A's. Uh 45 lives were lost you know, in Lee County or Fort Myers beaches, uh, just mostly from drowning. Um, you know, it's, and, and the, the cool thing about hurricanes is, you know, they're coming, mm -hmm. you know, so you have time. It's not like a tornado. You have time to, you know, to, to make a plan, even at the last minute, if you haven't already, you know, and to evacuate, to get to a friend and family's, you know, home or hotel, or, um, mm -hmm. you know, you, you do have the time to do that. Um, you know, but but listening, you know, listening to instructions and, and learning what the impacts are and and, you know, believing, believing the officials that, you know, this could get 15 feet and Fort Myers Beach saw it. Yeah, great points. I'll, I'll just add you you touched on or you nailed the the floods, you know, storm surge is number one cause of death during a hurricane, but also there's a lot of dangerous situations uh, with winds and and projectiles, like things that could have been taken care of, like bringing your chairs and uh, any sort of loose items from your yard into your house so they don't become something that's dangerous that hits somebody. That's the same issue with a tornado, but at least when you're preparing for a hurricane, you have days to make sure your home is secure like that. So the winds, uh, 
things hitting people. Uh, and then after the storm, you know, you could have a power outage for quite a while, uh, depending on the severity of the storm. So that really means a communications out outage. So if you uh, are someone who has a health condition or somebody who, um, you know, you're, you might be putting yourself in a dangerous situation because uh, fire, police, EMS, they're not going to be able to come and access you uh, right away, especially if you're in an evacuation area and you stay behind. So, um, you know, that's a really important thing to consider. Uh, extreme heat. So without, you know, power, that means we're, we're at an AC. So, you know, thinking about generators, if that's something that's really important for you and if you have a health condition, uh, you know, we got to consider that as well. And then after the storm, if people are quick to start to clean up at their property or, or clean up in the street, and you might have down power lines, and that can be a really serious, uh, dangerous situation. So you again, you won't have the, the EMS coming your way. So just a, a couple other things to think about that a lot of folks don't necessarily think about right away. This has been so helpful. I think that, and it also just shows the gravity of the situation that these are, you know, not things that we should take lightly. Um, mm -hmm. So I, I really appreciate, especially the, what y'all mentioned about, you know, trust the experts. Um, mm -hmm. You know, it's it can be easy um, to have, you know, I, I live in Tampa and, uh, you know, there's a legend that, you know, we haven't been hit by, you know, a hurricane in over a hundred years directly. So you have a sense of complacency. And so I think it's really easy for folks who haven't been hit directly that it's like, oh, we'll get missed again. So I think, you know, if, if you have a storm that's coming your way, make sure you take it seriously or any kind of disaster. Um, and along those lines, you know, and, and Mary, you mentioned the cone, the cone of uncertainty. Um, and, uh, you know, that's something that's a really big part of hurricane tracking. Um, you know, over the years, I've seen the hurricanes that will either, you know, form in the Gulf and then just immediately swerve into one of the coastlines, or they will be the ones that start off the coast of Africa and take weeks to get over here. Um, so can we talk a little bit about, you know, how does hurricane tracking work? Um, you know, especially if you're just going on Facebook or, or X or something, and you're seeing people post about watches and warnings and, and the spaghetti models and everything. Um, can we talk a little bit more about what these are and like the differences between watches and warnings? Yeah, I'll start since you mentioned spaghetti models. Um, <laughs> so, uh, Back to the other, so I don't forget that, you know, the one thing about what we just talked about too is, and is I want the one sentence I want to use a lot this year to Floridians is don't be stubborn. That popped in my head the other day. And I feel like we've been, you know, so many t curves and misses for a lot of folks over the years that people just aren't going to want to evacuate anymore. And, you know, we have to just not be stubborn and realize it's not a matter of, you know, if it's a matter of when. Uh, and back to your point about, you know, the Indian mounds you didn't mention, but. That's our little protection here, apparently, but uh, just don't be stubborn when it comes to that. But as far as tracking goes, uh, you know, I, I have spaghetti models on the site and spaghetti models are fascinating to folks because they present a different computer brain. I, I, I always compare every spaghetti model to a different brain and that's all the different computers thinking where storm is going to go. Um, and they are kind of blended into that NHC cone. Uh, so one thing you know, that's very important to note about that NHC cone, and, and this is the most often, you know, misconception about it, is that's anywhere the center of a storm can go. And so many people realize, you know, looking at that cone, like, oh, I'm over here on the edge, I'll be okay. Well, Fort Myers was always on the actual edge of that cone. Uh, so the NHC didn't get it wrong. It's just everybody focuses on that center line. So one thing to, important to know is anywhere that cone is, that's the eye of the storm, but the effects can go way outside that cone. Uh, so it's very important to realize that and that what they're doing new this year with the watches and warnings is, is I think, brilliant. Um, I've been lobbying for it for years is they're going to include watches and warnings now on that cone through the state. And what that's going to do is it's going to show those effects that are going to be way, way outside the cone, which should kind of blanket the cone a little bit. And all you're going to see now is blues for, you know, watches, reds for warnings. Um, you know, watch is an area that could experience uh, hurricane conditions, tropical storm conditions. And of course, warnings mean you are going to experience those conditions. Um, you know, I know, I'm sure you all see it and I post it too, but the, the watches and warnings get confused all the time. My wife always messes them up. We always laugh, but a watch basically means there's conditions, you know, and everybody uses that taco for an example. Like, so when you have all the good, all the ingredients are in place, that's your taco salad on the table but when you have the taco it's the warning that means oh my god you you know it is happening 
you will get these effects. Um, so a watch that basically means it could, and a warning basically means it is. Uh, and, and that's the big difference, uh, you know, that I, that I always try to make. Yeah, great points. And I liked your point about don't be stubborn, um, you know, be prepared to act. And uh, about the timing of things, you know, you're going to watch uh, your news sources and, and connect with your city and county's uh, channels of information, follow those orders very carefully because they're not going to make a call to evacuate until they know it's the right time to make that call. They're not going to do it too premature. And you don't want to evacuate too prematurely either because the storm can shift. Like he said, you know, it's the path of the eye of the storm uh, and it could go anywhere within that cone. So people get confused. They think it's going right down the center. That's not necessarily the case. It could shift and you could end up right in its path if you evacuate too early, which I think was a real issue during Hurricane Irma. Uh, we had folks traveling all over the, the state trying to get away from Irma as it's going down the east towards the east coast of Florida. And then it shifts and goes towards the west coast of Florida. And now they're running away, going back that way. So it's just, you know, you're, you might end up without gas, like in the middle of Florida, if you're, you know, moving too prematurely. So uh, yeah, just stay really closely connected with those announcements. Yeah, yeah the timing of those evacuations are, um, are really important. If you're, you know, we tell people to go tens of miles, not hundreds, you can stay mm -hmm. right, you know, close to home more or less. You just don't usually have to go that far to get into a non-evacuation zone. Mm -hmm. um, you know, even if it's a, a public shelter, but, um, you know, if you're going to leave, you know, leave early, leave early enough to avoid all of that traffic, mm -hmm. um, follow 511, you know, I, you can go two o'clock in the morning and there's not going to be as much traffic, you know, you kind of have to be a little smart about it. And uh, I, I don't know, I never speak to a group where there's not a couple people who have done it themselves, where they evacuate to the East Coast to get away from one of the hurricanes. And then, you know, and then the hurricane decides it wants to go to Disney. It wants to go to Daytona, too. So mm -hmm. uh, so being careful of that, uh, you know, the direction of the hurricane, making sure you go like really, you know, over to California or something. <laughs> <laughs> those things move. Well, I like your point, Mary. That, that was what I was going to say is that the, the tone has shifted from Irma and, and just evacuate tens of miles away. And it makes so much sense because, you know, the old saying goes, right, hide from the wind, run from the water. You're really just trying to get away from those direct coastal impacts that are severe. Um, you're going to have hurricane force winds possibly all the way up through the state. So you're going to get those effects no matter where you go, unless you go, like you said, to, you know, California. So um, it's important to, to note that and, and have, you know, one thing the state says, which I, I love is, you know, halfway full, halfway there. And even my dad is 86. He, he still says that always make sure you have gas in your, your tanks during hurricane season, because you mm -hmm. make that decision last second, guess what? There's a, a, a line a mile long and then there might not even be gas. So then you're panicking. So it's always a good, good, you know, tidbit to just always have gas. That way you can get the heck out and not stress. Yeah. Have you found lately, like five days out, you go and, you know, we activate and stuff. So it's like, let's get to the gas station. Half of them are already covered with right. those plastic okay. bags. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's, it's tough. I mean, and then little tricks too, I've heard along the way is, you know, the, the main gas stations are the ones that go first. So kind of in your head, know those little, little gas stations that are hidden on mm -hmm. back roads, especially Pinellas, you know, there's a lot of little hidden gas mm -hmm. stations off Belcher and whatnot. So the, it's funny because I'll hear stories like there's a line a mile long at this one, quarter mile away, that was open and there's there was nobody in line, you know? So kind of mm -hmm. having those tricks mm -hmm. too, like you said, with 511. 511 is, is looking at your traffic maps and it's so important to, to, to do that. So you know you're not going to be sitting in the interstate for an hour. <laughs> right. So let's talk about emergency kits. Why are they important and what things should we have in them and why? Well, I'll pass that to you, Pinellas County here. <laughs> well, you know, when I when I think about the, um, you know, seeing some areas, you know, after a hurricane hit, we tell people to have, you know, like seven days of supplies, um, you know, if, if something was to happen, seven days is really not enough. Um, you know, it's going to be a couple of weeks and, you know, you you have to be able to uh, take care of yourself. Um, you need to be able to eat. 
Um, feed your children, feed your pets. Uh, you're going to need to put tarps on your roof. Um, you know, if you evacuate, you're going to need all of that. You're going to need to to eat, to drink water, you know, all of those things. And then hopefully you can go back home and still, while wow, there's no power, there's no, um, you know, there's no, um, like uh, Sarah said, no air conditioning. Um, you know, while things are still a mess, basically, you still have to survive, you know. So back home, I tell people, leave, leave water, leave more perishable, leave tarps, leave tools. Um, you know, you got to think you're not going to have a source service. So what are you going to do about that? You know, you, you can fix yourself up, a, you know, a little toilet, but you have to have, you know, those things on hand. Um, mm -hmm. So it's it's extremely important because you're not going to be able um, to survive. Of course, we're lucky because we have um, uh, relief teams. They're volunteer relief teams for the most part that just they're waiting to go into whatever area gets hit the hardest and then beyond. Um, so there, there is food and there is water that's going to be coming into the area. Um, it's just, it's just being connected uh, to know, to know where that is. Yeah. And I'll add medication, like make sure you have enough of your medication to last a while um, and water, just tons and tons of water. Uh, I agree. Like seven days doesn't seem like enough, but when you try to plan out seven days worth of water per person in your household, that's a ton of water. Um, and you don't need to go buy it like bottled waters. You can fill up water, um, you know, from bottles that you might be collecting over time, like recycled bottles. So uh, that's one other thing to consider. Flashlights, batteries. Uh, you do not want to be in the in the dark, you know, night by night if there's a, no power. A battery powered radio would be really helpful um, if you're not able to charge your phones and, and uh, connect that way. At least you can listen to the radio and, and hear the news broadcasts there. And then another trick is, um, you know, the sewage system there might be issues with that. You might not be able to flush your toilets uh, with you might not have the running water. The cities might turn it off, but you can uh, uh, fill up your bathtub with water before you leave. And then you can use that water to flush your toilets. Pro tip. Good stuff. So a couple, couple of notes I got is, uh, you know, they always say cash, plenty of cash. Mm -hmm. um, reason being is you know, ATMs might be out, banks might be out of power, but if your local gas station has gas, they'll take cash. Uh, mm -hmm. So cash, they always say have that. And, and believe it or not, the tip a lot of people, my viewers have shared is a roll of quarters for mm -hmm. laundry mats. Um, you you be able, you know, to drive across town to your local laundry mat and they only take quarters. So that was always a tip somebody shared with me. Uh, but I always tell people something simple too, is a, a 12 volt, 110 volt inverter that plugs into your cigarette car lighter. They sell them mm -hmm. for 10, 15, 20 bucks at Walmart or even Amazon. Uh, but it's a way that you can plug in any, uh, right. you know, household items that you might need if you don't have any uh, electric. So that, that would be, you know, the phone chargers or, who, you know, who knows, but they, they come in very handy. Just a, it's a, a simple way to, you know, make your, your car at least be able to, you know, plug in any, any household item uh, that if you ever, if you're out of power and then back to generators, uh, you know, we talk about generators, just because you have a generator, you need to make sure you have gas. I, I know some people that buy, you know, they, they have a generator in their garage and A, they don't start it enough until it's time, and then it won't start. Mm. So you got to get into a maintenance program at least once a month, start your generator and have enough gas because you might go through five gallons a day with gas. So you got to have a plan. Just because you have a generator doesn't mean anything if you don't have extension cords to run into your house or, or gas. I always remind people of that. Mm -hmm. You know, and there's a lot of people who can't, um, who can't afford generators as well. Um, keeping in mind that, you know, there would be uh, cooling stations opening um, as long as there were power. I mean, after Hurricane Irma, we had some places, community centers, libraries uh, that did open and were able mm -hmm. to, um, you know, provide some cooling stations, some cover stations. Uh, people could charge up their phones, um, you know, keeping that in mind. And mm -hmm. You know, if you're if you're in a, like a, an independent living facility or something like that and people are, you know, boiling, I mean, you see that there's danger. Call for help, you know, mm -hmm. um, connect, you know, connect to us, connect, you know, call 911. Um, but, you know, there there are alternatives, um, you know, that and we're here to help with that. So because um, that, yeah, the heat, the heat is um, a big problem. Yeah, one more point real quick on that. Uh, when I went down to Ian after they had their storm, uh, 
mosquitoes bug spray. Uh, mm -hmm. if you have to keep your windows open because you have no power. Uh, a lot of places don't have mosquito control. Like you don't realize in the middle of the night, they're actually spraying for mosquitoes. And down there, I have never seen so many mosquitoes in my life. Mm -hmm. So locals were telling me, you know, they had to open the windows. But a couple of them didn't, you know, just wish they had a thing of uh, bug spray. So I believe, you know, that, that's something nobody talks about, but have bug spray. <laughs> yeah, that's a really good tip. And maybe also sunscreen if you're going to be out doing stuff mm -hmm. outside, sunscreen, bug spray, water. Um, and then I, I also think one of the most important uh, things in your toolkit is the list of all the things you should have, like your disaster preparedness guide. It'll have a ton of great information in there. A lot of the things we've been talking about will all just be listed there. So you don't have to memorize these things. You can have it and read through it during the storm. Uh, they'll have tips for before, after, uh, and during the storm, what you should be doing, thinking about, and they'll have a nice little checklist of all these items. So you can make sure you got all these things in your kit. So if you don't have a disaster preparedness guide, uh, your counties have these guides and that you can go get them in a, a county offices. I know a lot of libraries and even some grocery stores will, will start to stock them as we lead into hurricane season. So uh, call your county up, make sure you have your own disaster preparedness guide. They're updated annually. This is fantastic. I think that all of these suggestions are so critical and what's really nice and, and you know as we and this is also a good segue into you know the financial aspects of disasters and the impacts on us are you know how how to financially prepare for a disaster um you know everything that y'all have talked about is i believe covered under the state's disaster tax-free shopping holiday that's coming up in a couple weeks um and so this is a great opportunity where the state won't charge a sales tax um, on specific items that you purchase for disaster preparedness, whether that's the generators, um, pet food, you know, water, all that kind of stuff is is covered, um, which is which is fantastic. And as we talk about that, we do have a question from the audience, um, and I'm gonna kind of merge some questions together from the run of show. Um, so the question from the audience is, you know, you know, if you are generally and, and financially, um, even though this isn't always possible for everyone, is you should have you know, uh, several months of, of, you know, money stashed away in a savings account. So if you lose your job, you know, you won't have to, you know, you, you'll have something there. You know, how much should people save for disasters? You know, um, you know, keeping money out My when, you know, my partner and I, when we prepare for hurricane season, we take out a hundred. I don't know if that's actually enough, but um, that's something to, to that, that I would like to have the panel answer. And then along those lines, um, especially as we really uh, try to support lower and middle income families that, you know, where money, money might be tight and if they're, you know, living paycheck to paycheck, um, how do, you know, these kind of folks and families best prepare when it comes to disaster preparedness? You know, they might not be able to, uh, you know, get a hotel somewhere or buy a generator. Um, and so what are some things that we, they should keep in mind? And then along those lines, I'll tie in are there any, you know, resources or programs that either, you know, governments offer or other organizations that can support people in, you know, disaster prone areas? So a bunch of questions there. <laughs> <laughs> this is an area that um, I work in a lot and, and talk to folks a lot about. And, um, you know, people specifically people who are who are income or transportation challenged uh you know they're they're really worried about this they're not going to um i mean we all have uh, trouble you know saving money um there's not not going to be any money there um you know there's uh there's WIC there's snap benefits and they do have some items that are uh, non-perishables that you can you know can stock up with um, but, you know, transportation is a big concern to them. Our buses, our public buses do run free uh, to shelters. Uh, so we do have that um, that service. Um, they're concerned about their pets. You know, we have uh, there's public shelters, emergency shelters. They all differ um, in how they're run. Um, but I believe all of the counties have um, the pet friendly shelters and special needs shelters. Um, and we have the transportation assistance as well, where, you know, the fire departments will come and literally pick people up and bring them to the shelter, you know, for um, for nothing. Um, and that's and communication is also the uh, other concern that they have. 
um, which also costs nothing. Um, if you know how to plug into the information, like Sarah was mentioning a couple of really good ones um, to, you know, stay connected so that you can get, you know, those resources. Uh, there is help. Um, it's not easy for anybody and especially if you are challenged, um, but there are options. It's just, you know, get it. Like I say, I keep saying getting connected, but, you know, getting that information. Um, and Sarah, I know that there's like loss of wages, resources like that afterwards. Yeah, I can speak to some of the uh, government resources. I uh, before I do that, you, you asked about you know how much money should you save up, and I think it uh, de depends on what your expenses look like. Um, I've heard the the three to six months of your expenses should be what you what your goal is, but I mean that's it's really difficult to save that amount. So you know all all of Mary's points are really um, really important for that, but that. You know, three to six months of your expenses is what you should kind of try to set away. Um, but in terms of resources and, and programs, uh, the emergency management departments at your cities and counties, uh, they can provide a lot of great uh, information, you know, the latest, uh, most up to date information after the storm about different programs and, and post disaster resources. Uh, you know, when you're getting prepared for it, they, they're often giving out uh, sandbags and things like that. So don't think you need to go out and buy those things. Like Mary said, there's, wa you know, water and things like that you might be able to get uh, at a lower cost or for free from your cities or counties um, and the transportation that, that should be free. Uh, and then after the storm, uh, there's this thing called the, the Florida Disaster Fund which they'll activate. And that's uh, something you can uh, uh, join and become uh, eligible for financial assistance. So that's for individuals and families. Um, the first step after the storm would be to register for a hotline. Uh, so you'd call and, and join the program. And then it's really a timing thing. Like you want to make sure that you have uh, information ready so that you can join that list and kind of get yourself high on the priority or, or the next uh, person to be to receive funding list. So there's Florida Disaster Fund, uh, disasterassistance.gov is through the federal government, uh, uh, Federal Emergency Management Agency, FEMA, or, and they have a lot of resources available post-disaster. So your city or, or county officials would, I'm sure, be happy to help you walk through some of those steps to, to access these resources because there are resources out there for post-disaster, uh, you know, building back and things of that nature. Yeah, the, the one point that I want to make, I guess, that I've learned over the years, you know, one of these areas that were hit with storms is the way communities come together, I think is something that really I wasn't aware of. And uh, it's not official by any means, but you see so many people from out of state coming, uh, mm -hmm. you know, a lot of churches, just the, the overwhelming support that I see uh, feeding folks and uh, so th th this is something that I, I always say the, the positive of a storm is it unites these communities like I've never seen. And uh, there's always going to be somebody there for you somewhere. You might just have to look for it a little bit, but I have never not seen, a, a, you know, a huge outpouring of support of these places, barbecue place. I mean, it's just incredible the, mm -hmm. the way that storms, people come in to help. Um, again, that's not official, but there are that it will happen. So, uh, you know, that's the one positive out of a hurricane that, that I try to tell people if there is one. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I try to tell people too, you know, it's, we're not going to be alone. You know, you have your neighbors, you have the community, and then there's a lot of people, a lot of organizations right. yeah. that it's, come in to help. I mean, you're, you know, we're not, we're not going to be alone here. Yeah, it's incredible. Neighbors you don't even realize that, that you might have had will be the first ones with a chainsaw. And I've heard that story countless times. So, mm -hmm. you know, uh, Definitely. helps. <laughs> helps to know that, mm -hmm. that a little bit, that there'll be somebody there for you. The wonderful conversation as we're, as we're kind of uh, thinking about the hurricanes or the disasters coming, what kind of... Um, assessments should we take for our homes and our property and 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 how do we maybe look to make improvements to that to improve res, 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 resiliency with it sorry yeah. well the only thing i'll add or start off with is you know insurance companies that i know uh, friends of, of mine that really suggest videotape 
ahead of any of this storm. Just yeah. to have Stay evidence tuned. of anything that you have uh, pre-storm. If there's ever mm -hmm. a claim that you need to make, uh, it's very important to have that. Um, that's always a tip that they say they wish, wish more people have done. Yeah, I can jump in. We talked about some of the slogans like hurricane watch and warning. Another one is know your zone, know your home. Uh, you need to know which evacuation zone or sometimes they call them levels that you live in. They range from A to E. A meaning you'd be the first to evacuate. You live in the highest riskiest area. But one thing to consider is uh, mobile homes and manufactured homes, houseboats. It doesn't matter where if you're in an evacuation level or not, you need to evacuate. It is a man mandatory evacuation. So um, just, you know, if you live in a home like that, you need to keep that in mind that there isn't, you know, they're going to always say that you need to evacuate. And uh, another thing to consider is if your home was built um, after 2002, which is when the building code made some requirements and, and for protecting structures against hurricanes. Uh, so if you have a, generally a newer home and you don't live in an evacuation area, you might be able to shelter in place which would uh, free up space for uh, folks in shelters who, who really need to be there, who don't have anywhere else to go. Uh, so that's another thing to consider. You know, you need to know your zone and you also need to know the strength of your home and whether sheltering in place is a, a possibility for you. And then if you are sheltering in place or, or you're, uh, you know, reinforcing your home before you leave because you need to evacuate, uh, a lot of the strategies are about how we keep the wind out. So, uh, looking at your house, doing a you know evaluation of where winds could possibly enter the house. So where your roof meets your walls, where if there's any missing shingles on the roof, where the walls meet the foundation, uh, your windows. So impact resistance windows are the best, but it can be pricey if you don't have those. Uh, you want to board them up, make sure wind's not coming through. Any exterior doors, making sure they're all sealed up garage doors, they need to be tied down so they don't open and then wind comes through. Um, and they have kits for garage doors that, that may have um, came with the door when it was installed. Uh, sandbags for the water, that's another thing to, th to think about. Um, and like, if you wanna raise some of your stuff up, up higher, if you're really in a, a water risk area, uh, your TV and things, you can lift them up onto counters before you leave. Um, and then also keeping your trees and, and shrubs trimmed, um, any loose branches can really be a hazard. So uh, doing your part to make sure that you're taking care of your property and, and the landscaping and trees around there, um, and then bringing everything inside so it doesn't become uh, dangerous and, and fly and, and hit something and cause more damage. Good stuff. At one point you kind of brought up, I, I have friends at the Indian Rocks Beach that got flooded a few times and they have a lot of the five gallon buckets like from Lowe's and they basically mm -hmm. lift everything up. Um, mm -hmm. But talking to firefighters, you know, uh, if you are in a, a flood zone and you evacuate, it's always a good idea to turn your breakers off. Mm -hmm. uh, one, uh, once that water reaches a receptacle, it, it's dangerous. And, and we did have somebody during uh, Ada uh, that got electrocuted because of that scenario. So it's important when that water's rising, if your power breaker's on and, and you know, you know, you don't want to leave your house and then have, you know, firefighters come or whoever and have all right. that water being electric, you know, lectured. So, you know, you mentioned uh, just real fast, the photos earlier. Um, also, if I can uh, add just a little bit of a different subject, but after a hurricane, take pictures, take video, um, you know, we want to see the uh, water line. If you have flooding in your home, uh, take a picture of that water line because once it goes down, uh, you know, and this is for your own insurance, um, you know, for those that don't have insurance, uh, it goes toward, uh, you know, proving uh, the shape of your house for the resources and the benefits. And also, if you report it uh, to your county and counties have different tools, um, you know, to do this with. Uh, but then you can uh, kind of contribute to the uh, overall challenge of of being able to show that the area was basically hit hard enough so that we get more benefits and, and resources in there. So uh, pictures, pictures, pictures. And I'll just add to that, um, you know, all your physical stuff, if you have a waterproof, even a fireproof container, that's really important. Scan those things, scan your birth certificates, scan your social security cards. Like you need to also have electronic copies 
just in case you want to be, you know, extra uh, cautious about these things and then maintain those digital copies, not only in one source or one location, you want to have uh, maybe a cloud storage option. Maybe you want to email it to yourself, all those pictures and videos of your personal property uh, before the storm and after the storm, make sure that you are keeping them in multiple locations so that if anything happens to your cell phone where all those things are stored, you have backups. And email them to someone else. Because if you don't have any power or anything, maybe your brother out of state can uh, can help you out. Yeah. And, and one last thing on that topic, you know, when there's resources available, it's sometimes it's a race to get your name in, in on that list. Right. So if you haven't already scanned all these documents before the storm and they're not a part of your kit and they're right, right here, ready to go. A lot of times those are the types of information that they're going to need to get you on that list. So you want to have. You know, if, if it's insurance related information, you want to have those videos and photos right at your disposal so that you can uh, get right onto those lists and, and be eligible for aid as soon as possible. This is awesome. And I, I do want to do two quick reminders for our, our the attendees today um, that we do have a Q&A feature. So if you have any um, final questions um, for the panel before we wrap up today, please don't hesitate to drop those in the Q&A feature. Um, and then also, as a reminder, before you head out today or after you head out, please make sure you complete that survey. Um, as we look at the uh, home safety, I do also want to bring up that the legislature approved um, additional funding to My Safe Florida Home Program. Um, so this is for homeowners that, non-townhouse homeowners that want to enhance the safety and, you know, structure the stability of their homes. Um, so really quickly, this is just a, a, a match grant program where the state will match the dollars up to a certain amount that you pay toward your house. Um, and really quickly, for those who are interested in potentially applying for a grant, um, it opens up July 1st to low income homeowners over 60 years old. It'll open up to on July 16th to low income homeowners of any age. Um, on July 31st, it'll open up to moderate income homeowners above 60. August 15th, it'll open up to moderate income homeowners of any age. And then August 31st, it'll open up to all other Floridians. Um, so that they stagger this to, to you know, support the, the um, uh, communities and populations that might have difficulty um, uh, being eligible for services. Um, so definitely, if that's something that you're interested in, please take a look at. Um, and I know this is something that we've talked a lot about today, but I think it's important to emphasize is the role of communication. You all have touched on the importance of communication and staying up to date. So, you know, as folks leave the webinar today um, and they might say, hey, what should I go sign up for? What, you know, news alerts, what websites should they be going on? Um, do you have any general recommendations on, you know, ways to keep in the loop before hurricane season starts, you know, during hurricane season uh, and then throughout the year? I would say first off, Google your county emergency management. All the emergency management departments have the guidance, you know, specific to that county on their website, and that should have enough information um, about what emergency notification systems they have, uh, looking up evacuation zones for that area, et cetera. Second that, uh, you know, face, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, but make sure that you're following those legitimate uh, public accounts, uh, particularly emergency management from your county. Um, I think in this digital age, you know, there's a lot of misinformation leading up to the storm. So do yourself a favor and, and uh, tune into the official channels and tune out of the rest of that because a lot of there's a lot of fear mongering and there's a lot of, you know, uh, panicked people uh, taking their emotions onto their Facebooks. And, you know, that's not going to help the situation. You want to get the right, most accurate and up to date information about the movement of the storm or, or whatever disaster you're dealing with. It doesn't have to be a hurricane either. Um, and all that important information is going to be right there on your county's um, channels. And then also the state of Florida, I think I mentioned the alert Florida. Uh, uh, they can, you know, you can subscribe and you can get texts and calls. Uh, many counties also have a similar service, Alert Pinellas, uh, for example. So I would say social media is, is one option. And then also the alert system. So you're getting the most up to date information. Yeah, well, Sarah, I mean, that's that's the biggest thing right now with social media, because that's kind of, you know, my little niche. Uh, 
and there's so many folks out there trying to be, you know, a weather source and a lot mm -hmm. of them like the clicks and the likes, and it's so easy to, to post the worst case scenario model and get tremendous engagement. And, you know, I, so I think the most important thing for anybody is to, you know, have somebody that you trust and somebody that has a consistent track record. And, and that's who you're going to want to turn to when the time is needed. And, uh, that's your favorite local weatherman or weather woman, you know, I, I love wink. You know, I've, I love so many of our resources here in Tampa, but, uh, even like Matt Devitt and Lauren down there at wink news, they covered, uh, Ian and, uh, you know, you just, you, you get to know the people that you're uh, following. And that's, that's my advice is, um, just be careful out there. You know, I'm on TikTok of all places and there are so many people posting and, and the, you know, the end of the world scenarios and it gets people worked up. So that's, that's a problem. And I'm worried about it. If, if anything, just because it's easy to believe anybody and uh, people do believe what they see sometimes. And it's going to, it's always a problem. It seems like in, in this year, especially as we have so many people doing that. So just trust, trust who you're getting your information from. And obviously it starts from the top, like you mentioned, National, National Weather Service, National Hurricane Center, all your local counties um, and local Mets. Wonderful. Well, thank you three so much for joining us. I do want to give you each about a minute or so um, for any final thoughts that you'd like to share with the audience today. Um, anything that, you know, if I'm watching this and I can only take away one thing from this, what should be my key takeaway? And um, and Mary, we can start with you. Um, well, I think it all comes down to planning. Um, obviously, time is the one thing that we can't get more of. So, you know, the sooner you start, the better. Um, we know that some people wait until that last week. And, and if you do, you know, just, you know, get, get the information. Um, if you don't have a computer or anything, you can call your emergency management office. Um, you can look at your, you know, trusted media sources for information, put your TV on, listen to your radio, uh, go on the, the social media and find Mike. But, um, you know, just, just don't let time run out, you know, because once time runs out, you're, you're sheltering in place and you're, you're where you're going to be. And, you know, you don't want that to be a deadly place. And that's, just serious. Well, yeah, uh, you, people get in a panic mode when it's um, even with my storm chase and you, it, the storm comes quicker than you realize. And it's like, oh, my God, then you cut your head's not on straight because you got all this coming at you and you get. So, yeah, having that plan is so important. Uh, you know, I guess my my advice going back to the don't be stubborn. Um, going back to Ian, for example, you know, the first forecast had it going to the panhandle landing there as a weakening hurricane. That was kind of the talking points on the news. And that scenario was always there that it could turn and be a, still a major hurricane. And that's indeed what happened. So, you know, a lot can be learned from Ian, but the, the folks on the west coast of Florida kind of in their head thought, ah, it's going to be a weakening hurricane. It's going to hit Friday. Well, it turned it two days earlier as a major hurricane. So I guess it goes back to always being ready stay stay tuned uh the the first forecast for hurricane michael was a tropical storm in three days hitting the panhandle and it turned into a, a category five a lot of folks up there told me they saw that first forecast that's ah, going to be a tropical storm so weather changes i guess that's my point uh two days out it's nothing's guaranteed uh there's always those outliers that outside of the cone i think the number one thing i'm learning more and more and more is two days out usually the center is you know, probably not where the exact impacts are going to be. So always pay attention up to the last second as a, this storms can turn just a little bit. And, and again, don't be stubborn. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Um, and maybe on a more positive note, like our, our governments, cities and counties, they're, they're doing a lot behind the scenes to get, get us ready for these storms. Um, you know, we can and, and build resilience to these, these strong hurricanes by, First of all, taking the risks seriously, and then also having these conversations, ed educating yourself. Uh, the cities and counties are investing in community infrastructure, like stormwater systems. They're they're hardening the coastal areas. They're they're raising the roads and and bridges and things to to help protect our communities. But as a citizen, you got to do your part. You got to make sure that uh, you have your plan in place. You've communicated these things with everyone in your family. Everyone's on the same page. Uh, you know whether you live in an evacuation area, if you need to leave, um, you're listening to those uh, public channels, so you know that 
uh, when they make the call that you're ready to act because you know it's important to remember at the end of the day stuff is just stuff it can all be replaced but your life can't wonderful well mary mike sarah thank you again so much for joining us today um if you had a great time or you know not so great time today watching this please leave your feedback in the survey um, and make sure you join us for upcoming Money Matters. Uh, Peter, can you give a, a little taste on what we're going to be talking about next time? Of course, Matthew. So our next Money Matters is going to be uh, July 8th, 12 p.m. And our, we're going to talk about budget-friendly ways to enjoy summer activities with your family. We'll be in the middle of summer. We'll give you some great ideas and, and tips and tricks to enjoy summer with your friends and family on a low budget. Looking forward awesome. to it. Thanks, Pete. Thank you again to our panel. Thank you all for joining us today and have a great rest of your week. Thank you.